how many times have we looked for healing from God and it hasn't been there? How many times have we suffered the inexplicable death of a loved one and wondered why God didn't act in any of our pleas? Yes, there are many more people Jesus could have healed in Capernaum. There are many more people that Jesus and God could heal today. But what about those who aren't healed? What does it mean for us and for them? I don't know what your week has been like, but I feel that every week there's some new piece of bad news that comes up or something that, that unfolds that is not what we'd hoped or not what we'd expected. Uh, Terrence and I have had a couple of pieces of news come in this week that, that just are difficult. In both situations, we really felt brought to prayer and to just asking God to do something about these things. And while we don't know our Lord's purposes and we can't see the whole story, this place we're in of wanting God to do more is actually quite familiar. I think many of us, when we go through hard times or when, when we're faced with struggles, our response is to ask God, like, why me? Like, why do you have to do this? Why can't you step in and act? Um, a lot of our passages this morning, well, the Isaiah passage and the Psalm, both speak of God's amazing power, of just his authority over the whole universe. And, and yet, at the same time, it seems that there are situations and things where God could do something and doesn't. And that's really frustrating. We hear from a, a different passage in Isaiah that wasn't read this morning, where the author says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. It's this begging of God to come and do something. But it would seem that even when God does come, even when Jesus is present among his people, there still is a sense that not everyone in the pressing crowd gets healed or saved. Not everyone gets to touch Jesus' garment. So what does that mean when God does less than what we'd like? And essentially, that's what happens in this morning's Gospel reading. The disciples are left with a crowd looking for healing. And meanwhile, Jesus' response is to say, well, let's go to the other towns. Let's go and, and preach in the other synagogues. Let's go visit other people. It's time to move on, is what Jesus says, leaving the gathered crowd behind and leaving, as we'll find out later, at least one paraplegic man laying on his mat, feeling that he'd somehow been left out, that he didn't get the help he needed. But first, maybe let's back up a bit. If we pick up from last week's passage, we follow Jesus out the doors of the synagogue in Capernaum, where he cast out a demon, straight to Simon Peter and Andrew's house. Right when he walks in, he's told that Simon Peter's mother-in-law is ill with a fever. This illness has caused her to be bedridden, but Jesus takes her by the hand, lifts her up, and immediately she's healed. The cure is so complete that she's at once on her feet and starting supper preparations, which in the context of Middle Eastern hospitality would have healed her soul as well. And obviously this news of her healing spreads because once the sun begins to set, once the Sabbath is over, a crowd gathers at the door of the house. And from, from the perspective of Mark who's writing this down, and, and we believe that Mark actually heard all this news straight from Peter, um, it seemed like the whole town was at the doorstep. Like everyone came. Um, there are people who are sick of various diseases, as well as those who are demon-possessed. And Jesus spent from sundown to almost morning healing and casting out demons. He had to silence the demons, we're told, so that they wouldn't tell any, everyone who he was. But here we see Jesus healing on such a large scale that it does seem that he could heal the whole world. And finally, when it's almost morning but still dark out, Jesus goes out and finds a deserted place to pray. It's the first time of many when Jesus, especially after intense times with big crowds and lots of healing, 
will look for a solitary place to reconnect with God. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John hunt Jesus down, and when they find him, they seem perplexed as to why Jesus would be out by himself, why he wouldn't be with the crowd. They say, everyone is searching for you. And it seems like they're saying, there's more for you to do. What are you doing out here? There's still people we know who need healing. Come back. Come back into town. Come heal the rest of them. But Jesus has a different plan. He has a different vision for his ministry than they do. A ministry and a plan that, and probably a different vision and, and, and ministry of, and plan than we would have for him. He's not looking to spend his days on, in one spot as a one-man hospital. Jesus responds, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And so he spent the next, next chunk of time going throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, and casting out demons. We know from Mark that he eventually will return to Capernaum, where an even bigger crowd will be waiting for him, and where the friends of a certain paraplegic man will be so desperate to get him healed, so desperate not to miss Jesus this time, that they'll even cut a hole in the roof so that the paraplegic man could be healed. But here, at this moment, in the dark, we first get a sense that Jesus has a set plan of what he's doing. And it's different from what his disciples expect. It's different from what the crowds would want. And it's probably not what we would choose for him. But this is because his vision is much bigger, much more complete than we know. If we had the healing, miracle-working Jesus right next to us in the flesh, I think we would want him to stay with us, to stay in one spot. We'd want to tell our families and friends and anyone we knew he had any sort of ailment or any problem of any sort, just come see Jesus. Just come and be healed. And after one night in our town, we would not be satisfied. We'd know the people he'd missed. We'd want more and more healing. And so it leaves us with this strange and pressing question, what if Jesus didn't come to heal? What if his primary purpose was not to address the physical ailments of the people of Capernaum or even us? What if his big miracles, the casting out of demons, the calming of the seas, the feeding of thousands, what if those were not the main point? What if those were just pointing to the kingdom and power of God and were not the reason for Jesus' presence? What if his message is more important than his actions? How does that shift how we approach him today? And if we think about our own lives, how many times have we looked for healing from God and it hasn't been there? How many times have we suffered the inexplicable death of a loved one and wondered why God didn't act in any of our pleas? How many times have we wondered how cancer can leave one body and yet kill another? How many times have we told God just how unfair this all is? Yes, there are many more people Jesus could have healed in Capernaum. There are many more people that Jesus and God could heal today. But what about those who aren't healed? What does it mean for us and for them? And I think here is the central point of this passage and the central point of what we're to take away from this. Jesus came not just to heal. Jesus came not just to heal the body, but to change the interior as well. He comes to collect up his own. He comes to call us to himself, to give us a new identity, a new purpose that extends outwards. He comes to call us to be part of his kingdom, to be part of that work. And that's much bigger than just needing healing for one day or just needing food for one day. Jesus wants his miracles, his actions, to confront us. When he does heal, he wants us to recognize his power and to ask ourselves, how can we be part of the kingdom of God? How can we repent and enter into God's presence? In other words, Jesus' miracles are meant to point us to the kingdom of heaven, 
to bring us to repentance so we can be part of that kingdom. He doesn't just want us to be healed or fed once, but healed and fed for eternity. And we can wrestle with all sorts of anguish. We can be filled with supplications for the sick and dying, but until we see his bigger purpose, we will be stuck in a sense of bitterness and loss. And seeing this vision and purpose relates to more than just healing from sickness. It's also the demands that we place on God for things to go our way. Sometimes it's not just healing that we want. We want life to go a certain way. We want our own purposes to have a certain angle, to look a certain way. We want things to be okay for us. And sometimes as Christians, we feel that that's almost a right. But Jesus doesn't just want things to be okay for us now. The point of our life is not to be okay. Tish Harrison Warren, in her new book, Prayer in the Night, writes, Walking in the way of Christ can make life harder, in the short term anyway. The Christian story proclaims that our ultimate hope doesn't lie in our lifetime, in making life work for us on this side of the grave. We watch and wait for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. God's promise to make all things new will not be fulfilled till God breaks into time, bearing eternity in his wake. And strangely, this is good news for us, because it means that when things do go wrong, when we do lose people, when there is sickness, when there, is, or when there are accidents, when we're touched by misfortune or even just bad luck, that this isn't because God is trying to punish us, because somehow we haven't done the prayer formula right. God isn't trying to always have a lesson we need to learn, although often we do learn from difficult circumstances. God's vision is bigger than us, and it's bigger than all those things. And going through hard times doesn't diminish God's infinite love and care for each one of us on an individual level, but it calls us to look forward and to look up. When Jesus leaves town, it's not because he doesn't want everyone to be healed and whole. He gladly performed many miracles time and time again, but he wanted people to see that there's more to it than that. There's more to him than a healer, than a fixer. He wants to confront evil it itself. He's ushering in the kingdom of heaven, and he wants us to be part of that work. It's presumed that Mark wrote his gospel during the time of uh, the emperor, the reign of the emperor Nero, in the middle of a very violent persecution against Christians. And as I think as they face death, I think Mark wanted his readers to know that it was, it, as they face death for the, their, this belief in, in a Messiah that came to heal and save, that it wasn't just a Messiah who was going to heal on one day, but a Messiah that was going to change the whole cosmos. They needed to have a strong hope, a hope that they could trust even when they knew that themselves or their friends were going to be killed for their faith. They needed more than a healing Messiah. They needed a Messiah who had news that could change the world. The point of Jesus' ministry was to preach by his words and presence the good news of the kingdom of God, that it had come near. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This was why Jesus could not stay in one place. This is why he often got frustrated with the crowds who just came for the healing show or the miracles and who failed to see his true purpose. This is why the crowds abandon him at the end of his ministry. It's why he ends up alone on the cross. It's why in Mark 15, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. If only they knew that he was saving both himself and all people for all time. Jesus' scope was so much more than they could imagine. And it's because of the teaching and the resurrection of Jesus that the news we hear, the hard things we walk through, are also filled with hope. 
There's hope that even if God doesn't heal or change things, that his plan is not finished. When we see or experience tragedy, bad news, when we're tempted to wonder at God's inaction, at wonder, wonder why God doesn't come and do something, we can remember in these moments that there's so much more. There's so much more than we can see. That the kingdom of heaven is not done breaking through. Sometimes, though, our role, and this is a hard one, is just to watch and wait and pray. To Harrison Warren, again in the same book I quoted earlier, says, The reason I continue watching and waiting, even as the world is shrouded in darkness, is because the things I long for are not rooted in wishful thinking or religious ritual, but are as solid as a stone rolled away. The hope we have is as solid as a stone rolled away. And that's a hope that goes beyond the immediate circumstances we may face. It goes beyond our need for healing. It goes beyond even death. Because we know that the kingdom of God is among us and is breaking through even now. <laughs>